All primary training stations have certain things in common. They all have lots of primary trainers, yellow perils or yellow fighters as they're sometimes called. They all have instructors. They all have chief flight instructors who've been in the game long enough that their advice should not be taken lightly. And they all have cadets. Some of the cadets are alert and observing, and others are not. The chances are you'll never have to use your parachute. But when you need it, you need it bad. So don't bang it around. Keep it out of any place where you might get some oil, gasoline, or water on it. Water will slow down the chute's opening. Oil, gasoline, or water will rock the silk. And you'd be surprised how fast you come down in a ripped chute. If you want to be sure your chute will open, always inspect the release pin before you go up. Be sure the pin is not bent and the thread loop has not been broken. You've heard all this before. It's being repeated here because with parachutes, one mistake is one too many. Parachute jumping is the one thing in naval aviation that we don't practice, because the first time has to be perfect. Be sure your leg straps are tight. There are a number of sopranos around today who used to sing bass until they bailed out with loose leg straps. One thing more. There's just one way to carry a parachute, like this. Not by the risers, not bumping against your legs, but like this. Remember that, will you? So I said to this dame? I says, come on, babe. Let you and I go down to this little place on a corner and get ourselves a drink. It took some talking, but pretty soon. Hey, look how you've got that chute. That's not the way you're supposed to carry it. Ah, oh, there's more than one way of carrying a chute. And besides, I'm not going to have to jump. OK, so you're not going to have to jump. But think of the next guy that has to use that chute. You heard what the chief flight said. And he also said there's no smoking on the line. Ah, uh, he's just eager. Send that man over to my office. Maybe he's pretty lucky at that. He might have gotten tangled up in the harness and been dragged into a turning propeller. He might have had the chute on and buckled and been unable to get out of it. Of course, there would have been no trouble at all if Mac had been carrying his chute like this, with the chest strap not buckled and the chute itself held firmly under his left arm, where the ripcord is not likely to get caught on anything and the chute is protected. But Mac here has been on the base for a whole week, so he knows all the answers. At least, that's what he thinks. His friend Pete, on the other hand, has just arrived here from pre-flight. In fact, as yet, Pete is entirely unfamiliar with the Yellow Peril. So at this point, his instructor gives him the word on the pre-flight inspection. The first thing we're going to do today is learn how to inspect the plane. But, sir, you mean the pilot has to inspect the plane? I thought the mechs did all that. Well, they do, but the mechs are pretty busy. Sometimes one mechanic is responsible for several airplanes. Besides, you're the guy that's going to be up there in the plane, not the mech. But before we start the pre-flight inspection, let's talk for a minute about the uh, meat axe. Maybe you call it a propeller, but to experienced pilots, it's the most efficient beef cleaver on Earth. Just imagine the airplane standing there with that bloody bolo poised and ready to smash your brains out if you give it half a chance. Airplane standing on the line with nobody within 50 feet of them. I've been known to thrice through a couple of turns just for the hell of it. And if you happen to be in the way, that'll be where you came in and went out. A moment ago, you asked if the pilot inspects the plane. That officer over there is getting ready to go out on a hop. Watch what he does. 
First, he takes off his parachute and will lay it on the leading edge of the wing, just outboard of the end strut. And he lays it down gently. Why gently? Yes. Why lay the chute down gently? Mac here can answer that question. Just watch him for a moment. Wait till the chief flight hears about this. Our little discussion a moment ago about the propeller will give you some idea why the pre-flight inspection always starts by making sure the switch is off. That's what that fellow's going to do now. The switch on an airplane is somewhat like the ignition switch on an automobile. Sometimes the propeller plays tricks when the switch is off, but much more often when it's on. You've seen automobiles in which the steering wheel could be locked so it wouldn't turn? Well, the controls on an airplane can be locked too, but for a different reason. They're locked with a red handle in the lower left corner of the cockpit. When locked, the controls are held motionless, so the wind won't bang the ailerons around or the elevators and the rudder. So after checking to see that the switch is off, you push the red handle forward and up, and the controls are unlocked. That's all in the cockpit for the moment. And incidentally, when getting in and out of the cockpit, always step on the black catwalk. Otherwise, you're liable to wind up standing on the ground with a wing around your waist. Now you're ready to inspect the airplane. On fabric surfaces, always look for tears or breaks or wrinkles or bulges, which might indicate a structural failure or a broken spar or rib underneath the fabric. Notice anything that seems out of line or not quite right. Start with the trailing edge of the left wing and follow a path like this all the way around the plane. Uh, watch how that fella does it. Notice that he pays particular attention to the aileron, top and underside. Now you see why you unlock the controls before the inspection. Otherwise, you couldn't move the ailerons. Take a quick look at the aileron fittings to be sure they're securely attached and safety. Check all inspection plates to be sure they're well fastened down and test the after strut. Glance at the fitting bolt at the base of the strut. And check the wing tip, especially the underside of it, for tears in the fabric. Run your hand along under the edge of the wing tip for structural failures you might not see. Then take a good look at the underside. This part of the inspection requires special attention because wing tips and ailerons are occasionally damaged by someone dragging the wing in such a way that the damage might not be seen by the mechs. While you're at the wing tip, grasp the handhold and test the wing to make sure that the wing panel is completely rigid and securely attached to the fuselage. Listen for anything that sounds like wood splintering or fabric tearing, and watch for wrinkles or bulges. Test the wing firmly but gently. Moving on around to the leading edge, you next inspect the forward strut and the fitting bolt at its base. That little gadget attached to the strut is called the pitot tube is connected with the airspeed indicator in the cockpit. The airspeed indicator is the equivalent of the speedometer on an automobile, but it won't work if the pitot tube is covered or stopped up, so you check the tube. Test wires for tautness, but don't pull them too hard or you may damage the spreader, which serves merely to hold the wires in position and keep them from vibrating. At the same time, be sure the spreader is secure. Also, inspect all wires, See that they're streamlined into the wind and not twisted crossways. Check the underside of the wing for tears in the fabric and bulges or wrinkles which might indicate a structural failure. As you move in toward the lodge, keep one hand on the leading edge of the wing. Habits like that developed in the beginning may someday save your life. There are cases where old time experienced pilots have been killed by propellers because in a thoughtless moment they accidentally got too close. That's the cap to the oil tank he's taking off now. Sometimes there's a metal dipstick attached to the inside of the oil cap. If not, you should be able to see the surface of the oil by looking carefully. If you can't see it, call the plane captain. Of course, if you're like our friend Mac here, maybe you have unlimited faith in your plane captain, which is all right up to a point. But for Mac, it's just too much 
bother to check everything. So he skips the oil tank. But one day, Mac, old boy, you'll be up there, solo maybe, and things will happen. Yes, airplanes are funny that way. They won't run without oil. Also, it's a good idea to see that the cap to the oil tank is on tight. Otherwise, you're liable to find yourself in the airplane well oiled in a very literal sense. Next, the landing gear. That part he's looking at now is called the oleo and serves as a shock absorber. Check the fittings. Be sure the fitting bolts are secure and safetyed. And incidentally, when we say a bolt is safetyed, we mean it has a wire or cotter key through the end, like this. So even if the nut gets loose, it can't come off. Be sure the oleo is up, like this. Not down, like this. Glance at the tires. They look mushy, ask the plane captain to check them. And around the engine, always watch for signs of dripping gasoline or oil. Oil or gasoline on the pavement under the plane or on the landing gear struts probably indicates a leak and calls for investigation by the plane captain. As a further check, you may want to open the accessory compartment. This is done by loosening a couple of fasteners in the fairing. The gasoline and oil lines run through this compartment and any leaks will probably be immediately apparent here. And be sure the compartment is securely closed. When this cover comes open during flight, it does strange things to the aerodynamics of the plane, or it may rip off completely and go flying back, endangering the tail assembly. At this point, you glance quickly at the back of the engine to be sure all is well there. What do you look for? Wires which have become detached, cracked cylinders or exhaust manifolds, Take hold of the carburetor, try to shake it. If it's at all loose, the plane isn't airworthy. Now you retrace your steps along the leading edge of the wing, going clear back to the tip. Then forward and in again to a point directly in front of the propeller, but a respectful distance away from it. We can see everything we need to see from here without risking our necks. We can be sure the prop isn't nicked or pitted or cracked. You can check the fitting bolts around the hub. While here, look at the front of the engine for loose wires or cracked cylinders. And notice particularly the spark plug wires to see that they are safety. From this point, you can get a good look at the entire underside of the fuselage and the underside of the top wing. Here again, look for tears in the fabric or wrinkles or bulges. Check the oleos to see that they are evenly inflated. Notice whether the plane is setting evenly on the ground and is therefore properly balanced. If the landing gear is in any way structurally out of line, you must catch that at this point. Also, see that both wheels are chocked. Now you proceed to the tip of the right wing, still showing the same respect for the propeller. You begin at the wing tip and work in toward the engine, 
inspecting the same points on the right wing as were covered on the left. You don't open this side of the accessory compartment, but you do check to see that the fairing is fastened down tight. The oleo on this side, the tire, and the back of the engine. Then, back to the tip of the wing and around the trailing edge for inspection there, covering the same points that were covered on the other wing. Aft, along the fuselage, looking for tears, bulges, or wrinkles. Underneath the tail assembly, first the rudder cable, then the wires for streamlining and tautness. The fabric, and especially the elevator. On top, the fabric and the wires. Inspect fittings on the elevator and the rudder. Turn the rudder for a look at the rudder horn, first on one side and then on the other. Of course, some pilots like Mac here seem to doubt the importance of inspecting such items as the rudder horn. One small fact seems to have missed friend Mac. An airplane is neither useful nor healthy unless all the controls are in good working order. The rudder horn is in an exposed position. Occasionally, it gets broken. And here's an example of what can happen. Friend Mac, who uses his brakes too much in taxiing anyway, wouldn't notice it even if he had no rudder control at all. All is well, thinks Mac. He pulls around into the takeoff position, locks his tail wheel, and gives her the gun. As we were saying, an airplane isn't very useful or very healthy unless all the controls are in good working order. If you want to play safe, always inspect both rudder horns and all control cables and control surfaces. Also, inspect the tail wheel for inflation. The tail wheel is held in position by an oleo, which must also be kept inflated. Otherwise, the tail will drop down like this tail wheel assembly will not have the shock absorbing qualities which protect the tail from shock in hard landings. So check this. And then take a good look at the top side of the upper wing. This is about the only place that you can see it from the ground. After inspecting the left side of the tail assembly, proceed up the left side of the fuselage to the baggage compartment. You always open the baggage compartment. What you carry there varies with different stations and different types of planes. But you don't want to carry any unnecessary weight. And should the compartment accidentally come open in flight, you don't want dainty little items like wheel chocks to go spraying out over the landscape. Also, in some types of primary trainers, there should be a first aid kit in this container in the top of the baggage compartment. And be sure the compartment fasteners are secure. Now, you already know what happens to an airplane when it runs out of oil. Well, it won't run without gasoline, either. True, you have a gasoline gauge to tell you how much gas is in the tank, but gauges sometimes get stuck, which probably accounts for the old saying among flyers that the best gauge is your finger. So, you stand on the seat of the front cockpit, take off the gas cap, and find out for sure whether the tank's full. Never take a plane out that isn't full, right up to the top. And put the cap back on so it'll stay. If it comes off in flight, it may hit you and knock you out. And the high-octane gasoline spraying back on you may burn your skin or injure your eyes, to say nothing of the fire hazard it creates. One other thing. Anytime you're flying solo, always fasten the seat belt in the empty cockpit and draw it up tight so it won't loop over the stick when you're stunting or inverted. Now, that completes the pre-flight inspection, except for the cockpit, that is. So let's go over here to an airplane and go through the cockpit check. Okay, now before you get in the airplane, buckle your parachute, chest, and leg straps. Also, check both cockpits for loose gear. Some bad accidents have been caused by loose gear jamming the controls. It can be pretty disconcerting when you're doing acrobatics. Now, the first thing you do when you get in the cockpit is to adjust your seat belt and fasten it. There's no kidding about this. Too many boys have been killed because they didn't make proper use of their seat belt. Take the student who got his nose too high on takeoff. His instructor snapped the stick forward to prevent a stall. When he looked back a moment later, the student wasn't there. The 
abrupt change in the plane's attitude had thrown him clear out of the cockpit. That student had probably figured there'd be plenty of time to fasten his seatbelt after they were in the air. In inverted flight and in most acrobatics, sometimes even in normal flight in rough air, the seatbelt is the only thing that keeps you in the airplane. So fasten your seatbelt the very first thing when you get in the cockpit. Now, these are shoulder straps. There's a little lever on the lower left side of the seat which releases the harness in such a way that a spring on the back gives it a certain amount of stretch. With the harness unlocked, adjust the straps for moderately snug fit. For takeoffs, landings, and acrobatics, lean back, lock the harness so that the spring will no longer allow it to stretch. In case of an accident, it'll hold you back against the seat and keep you from breaking your neck by banging your head against the instrument panel or cowling. After you fasten the seat belt, draw up on the straps at the side until the belt is tight enough to keep you in the plane, but not too tight for comfort. Yes, sir. Mighty important, that seat belt. It even saves lives on the ground. has done something right. His seat belt is securely fastened. Jack off, switch off. Leave it to Mac. If this ever happens to you, leave your seat belt fastened until someone comes out to let you down gently. Now that your seat belt and shoulder straps are properly adjusted and fastened, Drop your hand to the lower right side of your seat. Pull up on the little lever you'll find there. That allows your seat to move up and down. Now adjust the seat so that if you look straight along the top of the fuselage, your line of vision will run directly through the center of the windshield. Release the lever and make sure your seat is locked. Now you're ready to adjust your rudder pedals. Push that little metal lever on each pedal to the inside. Adjust pedals so you have full throw and can comfortably apply brake without stretching. And so you can rest your heels comfortably on the deck with the balls of your feet placed lightly against the pedals. With your knees relaxed and the weight of your legs on your heels. Then make sure each lever is back in locked position. Now operate the pedals slowly, giving full throw both ways. And watch the rudder to see that it responds properly. Move the stick from side to side and watch the ailerons. Move it fore and aft and watch the elevators. Move the controls evenly so that you can feel any variation in pressures which might indicate that something is wrong. Now I'll glance down to your left and there on the side of the cockpit is the trim tab regulator. Its functions will be demonstrated later on. Meanwhile, just set it at neutral with the handle pointing straight up. In making the cockpit check, you will always begin at the extreme left and work from left to right, clear across the cockpit, covering each control and instrument. That way, you're not likely to forget anything. In this airplane, the cockpit check begins with a trim tab regulator and moves next to the throttle and mixture control. Set the mixture, the lower red handle, for full rich, and open the throttle about an inch. Still further forward underneath the instrument panel is a red valve which turns on the gasoline, allows it to flow from the fuel tank down into the engine. Turn this to the on position. Directly above on the instrument panel is the ignition switch, which we've already mentioned. But Check it again by sight and by feel to be sure it's off. Your plane captain's life may depend on it. Now we come to the instruments. Reading left to right, 
There's first the airspeed indicator, which, as we've pointed out, is somewhat like the speedometer on an automobile. At this point, it should read zero. Next, the altimeter. It tells you how high the plane is above sea level. You set it for field elevation before each flight. This is a turn and bank indicator. It'll prove invaluable to you later on. But for the present, forget it. The tachometer tells you how fast your engine is running in terms of revolutions per minute. It should now read zero. The oil pressure should also read zero, and the oil temperature should be about the same as the temperature of the outside air, or warmer if the plane has been flown or warmed up recently. This handle operates the engine fire extinguisher. It releases a bottle of CO2 in the engine, which will put out most engine fires. But uh, don't pull it just to see what'll happen. In fact, you won't need to pull it just to see what happens, because we're going to show you. The inimitable man will demonstrate. Oh, engine fire extinguisher. I wonder how it works. Uh, I bet you it's out of commission. Let's see. You just pull the hand. The engine will usually quit when you use the engine fire extinguisher. You make an emergency landing, perhaps in somebody's cornfield. You phone in, and you have some very embarrassing explaining to do. There's no discredit attached to an emergency landing, you understand, provided it's unavoidable. But emergencies such as this one are a needless risk of the student's life and of Navy equipment. Use the engine fire extinguisher only if there's a fire in the engine. If any other part of the plane catches fire, use the cockpit fire extinguisher. As part of your cockpit check, better be sure the cockpit fire extinguisher is properly secured so it won't come loose when you don't want it to. Now you're ready to start the engine. But first, a word about the plane captain. His job is a tough and a thankless one, without glamour, and he deserves your consideration. The plane captain's a busy man. He has other planes to start besides yours, so he may want to start cranking before you're ready to go. Don't let him do it. Before he starts cranking, he must challenge you with... Yes, son, switch off. He must not start cranking until you reply to his challenge. If he does, ask him to wait. Then, when you are ready, Give him a nod, and when he says, Yes, i switch off. You very quickly check your gas valve and ignition, then answer his challenge. Gas on, switch off. Plane captain will then prime the engine and crank it. And while he's cranking it, hold the brake. This you do by pushing into your toes on the top of the rudder pedal. Holding the brake keeps the plane from rocking back and forth while cranking thus makes the plane captain's job easier and safer. When the inertia starting mechanism is turning over at a good rate, the plane captain will stand clear of the propeller and challenge you. All clear. Meaning that he and all other personnel and equipment are out of the way of the propeller. If the area looks all clear to you, you answer his challenge. All clear. Then he immediately challenges you. Contact. You reply, contact. Then you quickly turn the switch to both. Whatever you do, don't pump the throttle. It does not help to start the engine, but it does overload the carburetor, thus creating a fire hazard. As soon as your engine starts, take a look at your oil pressure gauge. If within a half a minute it doesn't come up to the minimum operating pressure specified in the pilot's handbook for that particular plane, the engine must be stopped quickly to prevent damage. If you have the type of plane in which the crank is carried in the baggage compartment, throttle back a little so that the plane captain can stow the crank without having his hat blown off. But listen to that engine. Don't let it die. Throttle slowly if it starts to miss. And watch the plane captain while he buttons up the baggage compartment. Be sure the fastenings are secure. Now turn your attention to the oil temperature gauge. Keep the engine turning over at 800 to 900 RPM until the minimum specified oil temperature has been reached. 
Then you're ready to test your mag. First, look around behind you. Be sure the area is clear. Yes. And this is one of the many ways in which our friend Mac wins friends and influences people. Take a good look aft to see that all is clear. Then put on your brakes. And continue to hold them on. Hold the stick all the way back to keep your tail down. Gradually advance the throttle until you're turning up 1,400 RPM. Now turn the ignition switch from both to left. Watch the tachometer. If it falls off more than 100 RPM, the plane's not airworthy. Next, turn the ignition switch back to both and wait until any lost RPMs are picked up again. Then turn the ignition switch to right. Again, you should not lose more than 100 revolutions per minute. Return the switch to both and ease the throttle all the way back. With the engine idling, turn the ignition switch to the off position for just an instant to be sure it'll turn the engine off. Now, if the plane has passed your inspection and testing, you're ready to taxi out for the takeoff. But suppose that sometime during the inspection you find something wrong. Let's take an imaginary case. First, you call for the plane captain. It may be that he can fix the trouble in a few minutes. And he, in turn, may call the line chief. But if they can't fix the trouble or you're not satisfied the plane is airworthy, contact the duty officer. Describe to him the difficulty to eject the plane and ask him for instructions. That's the procedure if you find something wrong with the plane. Now, stopping the plane is a relatively simple matter. Set the throttle so the engine will operate at 800 to 1,000 RPM and let it run that way for about a minute to cool it off. Then bring the mixture control back to full lean position. This will kill the engine. When the prop has stopped turning, turn off the ignition switch immediately and open the throttle all the way. Move the mixture control to full rich and close the gas valve. Lock the controls by putting the stick full forward in the center. Neutralize the rudder pedals, push the control lock handle forward, down, and back, and then jockey the rudder pedals until they lock in place. Finally, lock the tail wheel, then call out to the plane captain, gas off, switch off, controls locked. Gas off, switch off, controls locked. Gas off, switch off, controls locked. That's the pre-flight inspection and starting and stopping procedure. After you've had a little experience, you'll be able to inspect the plane covering every point and start it, all within just a few minutes' time. The idea is to develop a regular routine. Form the habit of covering every point quickly and well. Also, all primary trainers are not exactly like the one we've seen today. There are several different models. So you'll find it profitable to study the pilot's handbook for whichever model you'll be flying. And remember that the airplane is a delicate instrument. Whether in the air or on the ground, treat it with care and respect. <laughs>